So thank you, Tom, and uh, I applaud what Finn is doing to help uh, educate uh, individuals about this disease, uh, prostate cancer. So if you'll bear with me just a minute, I will see if I can get this presentation to come up here. Now, uh, active surveillance, and when you think about it first, you might ask, why in the world would anyone not want to treat a deadly disease? But I'm going to make the argument this morning that this is a very underutilized approach and we should be talking about it uh, more. Everyone can see the slides, I assume? Yes. It's good. So uh, I have no disclosures. I'm not going to talk about any patents or, or any things that Tom uh, asked us not to do. But uh, I want to emphasize that when a man gets diagnosed with prostate cancer, this is truly a management dilemma. And here is the reason. For the majority of men, there is absolutely no evidence of a greater benefit for one management option over another, and that includes no immediate treatment. Think about that for a minute, because most men are diagnosed after age 65, and a large proportion of those men have a disease for which randomized trials have shown no benefit. And that's what makes this such a hard decision for men. Active surveillance programs, as a result, of what I just told you have grown all across uh, uh, America and North America. But the fact is they're mostly in academic institutions and a lot of men today never hear about active surveillance as a management option. So I'm going to address three uh, separate areas. First, to try to talk for a minute about the concept and the rationale of active surveillance. Second, the selection of uh, candidates and finally the outcomes that we know about today from active surveillance programs. So let's start with the uh, concept and rationale. I'm sure everyone at this conference knows that today a diagnosis of prostate cancer starts and is initiated with a screening process. Most men today get a diagnosis through screening. And screening for prostate cancer results in a large proportion of men who are treated unnecessarily. Why? Because of overdiagnosis. Let me define overdiagnosis as the diagnosis of someone who otherwise would never have known that they had prostate cancer if they hadn't been screened in the first place. So you might ask, well, what proportion of men are overdiagnosed with screening? It's estimated to be about one in four overall. But for those men over age 70, it's about 50 to 70%. So a lot of men diagnosed today are overdiagnosed with a disease they never would have known about. The reason this happens is because these non-lethal cancers are very, very prevalent. They're extremely easy to detect with a needle after a PSA suggests that there's a problem. And additionally, the rates of screening are very high. They're high in the elderly and those in poor health. And those are the very, very groups of individuals for which we have trials suggesting they're not going to benefit from treatment, yet we screen them at high rates. And finally, in our healthcare system, as I'm going to show you, virtually everyone who gets diagnosed today gets treated almost immediately. So how could we reduce the harms of prostate cancer screening? I think there are two ways. We could do a better job at targeted screening, that is, identifying the individuals who are most likely to benefit from screening and our focus our efforts in screening those particular individuals, something I'm not going to talk about today. Second, um, we could reduce overtreatment by simply educating men that for, for some men, Treatment is not necessary. We don't need to treat every cancer, and that's what we call active surveillance. Active surveillance isn't watchful waiting, though, and I want to make a distinction. You can see in this cartoon, the patient says, I know we agreed to a period of watchful waiting, but this is more watchful waiting than I bargained for. <laughs> so let's make a distinction between watchful waiting and active surveillance. Watchful waiting was a term that was popular in the era before PSA screening. Remember, most men in that era had disease that was advanced and often couldn't be cured. <coughs> also, the treatments at that time were quite morbid. So the physician and the patient wanted to do everything they could to avoid treatments. And these were men that often had a limited life expectancy, had more advanced disease, 
So the idea was to delay treatment until the disease was advanced, at which point palliative treatment would be initiated, usually with hormonal therapy. However, as opposed to watchful waiting, active surveillance is a very, very different concept. Here, we're talking about individualizing management. That is, taking individuals who are fit for radical treatment, they have localized disease, we think often they don't need to be treated immediately, and the idea would be to monitor these people very carefully and then intervene at an early period should the disease progress and intervene at a time when the disease is still curable. Now, there are two randomized trials. I want to pause for a minute and just make sure that everyone in the room understands that a randomized trial is the type of data that the FDA requires to approve a drug in this country. So if you wanted to approve a drug, you'd have to have a group that got the drug and a group that didn't get the drug. Here we're talking about exactly the same trial, a trial that compared an intervention called radical prostatectomy to a non-intervention called observation. And these two trials are very important, and I'll explain why. The first trial was in Scandinavia, and it occurred in an era before PSA screening was prevalent. So these were not the men diagnosed today. These were men who had disease five to 10 years more advanced than what we're diagnosing today. Yet, surgery resulted in no reduction in metastatic disease or prostate cancer death, no reduction in prostate cancer death among men over age 15 years, 65 years. And that was over a 15 year period. So men over age 65 didn't benefit. So who did benefit? Men under age 65, seven men under age 65 would need to undergo surgery to prevent one prostate cancer death. So six out of seven did not benefit over a 15 year period. The second trial, the PIVOT trial, occurred in the PSA era with 10-year follow-up, and surgery did reduce prostate cancer death, but the group of individuals who benefited were those men who had PSAs over 10 and those with high-grade cancers. So the take-home message is here, if you're a younger man, sorry, an older man over age 65, and you don't have a high-grade cancer and you have a PSA over 10, you probably should not be asking which treatment would be best for me you should probably be asking, do I need treatment at all as a first step? Now, this would be a slam dunk. Treatment would be a slam dunk. We can detect it. It's been labeled as a cancer. Why not treat it? And that would be um, the conclusion virtually everyone would come to, except there are harms associated with every treatment we have. Now, this is the best data that I can summarize for you that shows the benefits and harms for 100 men in this country who get diagnosed with prostate cancer. So all, all of them are diagnosed, and we're going to look at the outcome over 15 to 20 years. The colored light uh, green color uh, represents that 90 of them will be treated, because 90 percent of men who get diagnosed get treated in this country. The orange bars, uh, colored bars, represent that out of those 100, 40, if they get treated, are going to have some bother from urinary, sexual, or bowel problems. I'm not saying how extensive they are, but they will have some bother from that. And then finally, the benefit, perhaps 11 to 12 individuals will have prostate cancer death prevented or prevention of metastatic disease. So again, treatment of prostate cancer is not a slam dunk. One has to consider the harms that are associated with treatment. And for that reason, the American Urologic Association, the European Urologic Association, the National, Com National Comprehensive Cancer Network, all include active surveillance as an option for management of localized prostate cancer. But there is a great deal of uncertainty surrounding uh, surveillance in terms of how do we select candidates, who are the best candidates, when we select them, how do we monitor them, what are the triggers that should say you need to be treated at this point, and what are the long-term outcomes? So for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk to you about selecting uh, individuals uh, for active surveillance. Now, two uh, considerations in talking to patients about surveillance. One needs to consider not just the patient, but also the tumor. The tumor is important. In other words, 
does the particular tumor this person's been diagnosed with put them at risk of death from prostate cancer? And we generally use grade, PSA, and the stage of the cancer to make those determinations. There are a lot of exciting things going on in the area of imaging, such as MRI, and I think yesterday you may have talked about gene signatures or gene panels. I think these are exciting uh, developments, but at this point I don't think we know exactly how to use them to select patients for surveillance, so I'm not going to talk about those. We also have to take the patient into consideration because those who have a shorter life expectancy are less likely to benefit from being treated. So we have to take age and overall health into consideration. And for a disease where physicians don't know the answer, in every case, patient preferences have to pay a large decision, a, a large part of the decision. So uh, let me talk about grade for a minute so we're all on the same page. Um, the Gleason grading system is what we use to grade cancers. It's a very important part of our assessment. And the pathologist then looks under the microscope and assigns a grade on a scale of one to five, which I'll show you has been modified. Five being the most aggressive looking cancer, one being the least most aggressive. And since cancers are made up of multiple grades, the pathologist actually assigns the first most prevalent pattern and the second most prevalent pattern and adds the two together to come up with a score. In reality, uh, the pathologists no longer grade or assign grades of one and two. So today, they are grades of three, four, or five. And if you were going to add those grades together, you would come up with scores of between six and ten. It turns out that a lot of experts in this country believe that Gleason 6 cancer should not even be called cancer because it, in most cases, behaves in a very indolent way. Our approach at Johns Hopkins, instead of um, calling Gleason 6 no cancer or not cancer, our approach has been to uh, use a classification system that um, gives patients the idea that when they get diagnosed with a Gleason 6 cancer, they're at the least aggressive end of the scale. There are one out of five. If they have a higher grade cancer, for example, eight, then there are four out of five. So we emphasize to patients with Gleason 6 disease what you see in the very bottom of that slide. You're a one out of five, and your risk of death as a result of prostate cancer is similar whether you get this treated or not over a 10 to 15 year, year period, as long as you have low stage disease and as long as you have a PSA less than 10. And I think that um, at least helps patients understand that they're in this very low risk category for which we think surveillance is, is appropriate. I mentioned stages, uh, which are also important. Stage is assigned based on the digital rectal examination, what can or cannot be felt on rectal exam. And the two stages that I circle there, T1, meaning nothing can be felt on rectal exam. You see the picture of the prostate with the cancer in the middle. And T2A, which means minim minimally palpable disease on rectal exam, we also feel are appropriate for surveillance. Whereas stages that uh, reflect more extensive disease or disease beyond the prostate, we believe, and most experts believe, they would not be appropriate candidates active surveillance. So um, to summarize the individuals that we think are prime candidates or best candidates for surveillance, we, could use, we use two risk classification schemes. The first one was popularized by Anthony D'Amico, a radiation oncologist, and in this um, a classification scheme he uses stage T1C, T2A, which I just told you about. PSA less than 10. Remember, we saw in a randomized trial that it was the men with PSA over 10 that benefit. Men with PSA less than 10 less likely to benefit from treatment. And those with a Gleason score 6 cancer, which I told you some experts believe shouldn't even be called cancer. The second classification system was one that was popularized by John Epstein at Johns Hopkins. And that includes men who have disease that can't be felt on rectal exam, stage T1C, a PSA density less than 0.15, that just simply means the PSA is less than 
of the size of the prostate, a very strong predictor of whether or not aggressive disease is present. Again, a Gleason 6 cancer, less than three cores with any cancer, and no more than 50% involvement of any core with cancer. And it turned out that those criteria, the Epstein criteria, were very predictive of the absence of aggressive disease. So together, one could think about men with this disease or these criteria as having favorable risk disease. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network is a group of cancer centers throughout the U.S., and they put together guidelines for management of all types of cancer, breast, pancreas, colon, and their recommendations for prostate cancer is that for those with a very low risk disease that meet the Epstein criteria, who have less than a 20-year life expectancy, active surveillance is actually the preferred option. Not treatment, but active surveillance. For those men in that low risk category, that fell into the D'Amico classification scheme, for those with more than a 10-year life expectancy, all of the options, surveillance, radiation, radical prostatectomy, would be considered reasonable options, but uh, the uh, opposite side of the coin, if they had less than a 10-year life expectancy, surveillance would be the preferred management option. So I told you that uh, the tumor is not the only important factor here. The patient is also an important factor, um, and um, one needs to consider both the patient's overall health state and their age in making a decision about whether surveillance is right for them. So in this um, study, which is called a decision analysis, um, what we are looking at here is whether surgery or surveillance would be the preferred option based on how many additional years of life uh, were left after the treatment. But it's not just years of life, it's quality adjusted life. So it takes into account the quality of that life. And so what one can see on the axis where you see poor to excellent health is um, uh, from the bottom, poor health at the top, excellent health. And on the other axis, the um, uh, horizontal axis, you can see age from 50 to 75. So look at the little check there. The cross shows a 65-year-old man who's in average health. And for that individual, active surveillance would be preferred. But if you took that X and moved it up to the top of the slide, where that 65-year-old is now in excellent health, surgery may be the preferred option. On the other hand, if you go down to the lower age groups, say 50 to 55, for the person in very poor health, even if he's young, surveillance may be the preferred option. And you can also go over to the far side of the graph, men who are in their 70s, virtually nobody in their 70s who has favorable risk disease should, in my opinion, be considering treatment of prostate cancer because these are the men that almost certainly are not going to benefit from treatment. Now, there's one caveat to this study. All of these results were very, very uh, easily moved or changed by a patient's personal preferences, which are very important in determining the outcomes I just showed you. So the ideal candidate for surveillance, in my opinion, is the older man with a 10 to 20 year life expectancy or less. He has very low to low risk disease. I just gave you the criteria for that. And also the person's personal preference is to avoid the side effects of treatment. And it's usually a person who values the present more than the future. In other words, a person who is very interested in his quality of life. So let me talk for, at last uh, for just a moment about some of the outcomes in active surveillance, and I'll summarize these for you in active surveillance programs in North America. The most common trigger, if a man is in surveillance, the most common trigger for intervention is the PSA is going up, or on a follow-up biopsy, he has higher grade disease. It's no longer Gleason 6 disease, and it appears more aggressive. About 25 to 50 percent of men are going to end up being treated in five to ten years. About one in four of those get treated not because something was found on a biopsy that was scary or looked more aggressive, but because they became uncomfortable with surveillance in the first place and left to be treated. A third, 30 to 40 percent, we find a higher grade cancer and that triggers the intervention. 
and at about 30 to 40 percent, the PSA goes up, and that triggers the intervention. Most grade reclassification, what I mean by that is when we find a higher grade cancer in our surveillance program, the vast majority of it occurs in the first couple of years. Why? Because the biopsy is usually missing the high grade cancer, and follow up biopsies eventually find it. Not because we don't think, we don't think it's because the Gleason 6 changed into a higher grade cancer over a longer period of time, but rather because we missed it in the first place. And uh, last, the cancer-specific survival, meaning death from prostate cancer, is extremely unlikely over 10 years. In other words, far less than 5 percent of men who are monitored over a 10-year period in surveillance are going to die of prostate cancer. So now a little bit about the Johns Hopkins program. You can see um, since 1995, <coughs> the um, cumulative recruitment of men into our surveillance program has grown dramatically and now we have around 1,200 men in the program. Um, and recruitment has been a little more rapid in the uh, last years as opposed to the early years of the program. The average age, which you can see on that graph, is about uh, 67. That's a frequency plot that just simply shows you the number of men by age who had this very low risk category versus the low risk category. And it turns out that about 80% are very low risk and about 20% low risk. 89% are Caucasians, 7% African Americans, and 4% others. So we are underrepresented in terms of uh, minorities. We follow men at Johns Hopkins with, uh, every other, we, with a twice yearly digital rectal exam and a PSA test and an annual prostate biopsy to assess their disease. And then again, the trigger, our trigger for intervention, for telling a man he needs to be treated is finding a more aggressive cancer on a prostate biopsy and not a rise in PSA. Now, I want you just to look at the very last uh, column of this uh, slide where it says rate per 100 person years, because what that actually is is percent per year. And it shows you the outcomes in percent per year. So if you look, exit from program, about 13% of men per year are leaving the Johns Hopkins surveillance program. Why are they leaving? You can see right underneath that, 10% per year are leaving to undergo curative intervention. And under that, you see about 9% are being reclassified. We find something on a biopsy for which we say you need to be treated. So the difference between that 9.7 and 8.9, or rather 10% and 9%, are the proportion of people who um, undergo curative intervention even though they don't have an absolute indication for it. Going down further, you see 4% of men per year get upgraded. In other words, they have a higher grade disease, higher than Gleason 6, and that would also trigger intervention. And then death from another cause, non-prostate cancer, 0.5% per year. And since this slide was made, there's been one death from prostate cancer in this program, uh, which means one death in about 1,200 individuals who've been in the program. Now, having done this for 25 years or maybe a little more, I can tell you what patients want to know. What do I have to lose if I am not treated immediately? That's what patients want to know. So uh, a group of collaborators from Johns Hopkins, from the National Cancer Institute, and from UCSF uh, put uh, data together to try to address this question, and it, this is modeling data um, because it's the only way you can answer that question right now. So what um, the investigators did is they looked at the time to treatment in the Johns Hopkins surveillance program, and then, assuming that some of the men in the program would get treated, they looked at if they were treated, what would be the time to PSA recurrence if it occurred, and if PSA recurrence happened and they underwent treatment, what would be the time to prostate cancer death? So all of those parts of the model are very well known. And then the investigators ask, so what would happen to men in a surveillance program versus men who underwent surgery immediately? And you can see on the slide, the model projected that 2.8% of men on surveillance and 1.6% of men who underwent immediate surgery would die of their disease in 20 years. If you looked over a lifetime, it was 3.4% for surveillance and 2% for immediate surgery. 
Now, that translates into an average project projected increase in life expectancy associated with immediate surgery of 1.8 months. In other words, the advantage for a person undergoing surgery immediately versus surveillance was an additional 1.8 months of life. The uh, benefit on surveillance would be that that person on average would remain free of treatment for an additional 6.4 years. So the conclusion of the study is at the bottom of the slide. Active surveillance is likely to be, produce a very modest decline in, in prostate cancer uh, survival among men diagnosed with the favorable risk disease we talked about, but it could lead to significant benefits in terms of quality of life. So how many men in the United States would qualify for surveillance? That's what this slide shows you. Pay attention only to the light part of the bars, which are men with favorable or low risk disease. That's the proportion of men who at diagnosis have disease for which surveillance might be appropriate. And gen then just look at the men beyond age 61 and above and above 80. So that represents about 30 to 40 percent of older men, not just who I think would be appropriate for surveillance, but who randomized trials have shown these people would be appropriate for surveillance and probably should not be treated. Now let's look at the disconnect, what's actually going on in the United States. And that was my uh, whole point for making my original statement that surveillance is underutilized. You're looking at the bars uh, represent the proportion of men who get treated and the proportion of men who don't get treated uh, by age after they get diagnosed with favorable risk disease. So you're only looking at the group of men for whom surveillance would be most appropriate. And notice that in the older age group, only 12% of men aged 65 to 74 are not being treated. And this is the astounding uh, uh, fact, I think. 80% of men, only 21% are not being treated. 80% of men over age 75, despite the fact that randomized trials tell us these men should not be treated, 80% of them are being treated. So let me summarize. Um, Overtreatment of prostate cancer is a very serious problem in this country, and it is precipitated by screening for prostate cancer. We all know that screening is beneficial, but this is one of the bad parts of screening. The ratio of benefit to harm with prostate cancer screening, I believe, could be improved dramatically with wider acceptance of active surveillance for the carefully selected men. And that's exactly what we've been trying to do at Johns Hopkins is identify those men for whom surveillance would be safest. So thank you very much for your attention.